I guess, Mark, I want to, I mean, Cinema Verite, wow. It's, uh, for those who aren't filmmakers, Cinema Verite, or those who don't know, Cinema Verite is when you let the action just happen and you try not to involve yourself and, and I don't usually, I do Cinema Verite-esque filmmaking. By the way, I'm Roger Sherman. I'm on the advisory board. I'm a filmmaker. And as a director, you guide things. You can't take total control, usually. That's not nice. So you say, oh, go and do this, or let's talk about this. But Mark, are, are you underwater with them? <laughs> um, I think I took the, the message of, of to be as hands off as possible to the extreme by not turning up on the shoot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that was actually very wise. I, I would have been terrible underwater and there's absolutely nothing that I could have done to make Patrick any less brilliant than, than he is. I would, have, I would have just screwed that up. And as for the thought of directing whales, that is of course, a, you know, completely impossible and unnecessary. So. I'm afraid I took the ver Veritas thing very literally. That's, that's wonderful. So those moments where you were face to face with the other camera person, where you were turned upside down, those were just spontaneous or you talked about that. As a director, those are the kinds of things you'd say, well, I've seen the footage, so do some more of that kind of stuff, do some fun, but no. Yeah, it's amazing that, you know, these, these wildlife films, the animals never get the call sheet. And so, <laughs> you know, you go in with a plan and you want to do something in particular. And then I, I've never been on a shoot where it happens like the script. So you just have to hope that uh, amazing things happen and uh, and you do the best the best you can. I mean, of course, you know, Mark and I talked about it before. The whole plan for the shoot was to go find Dolores and have her... Uh, do something more amazing than in year one and in year two. And then when you find her and she swims away with a big male, it's like, oh, well now, <laughs> what now? <laughs> what, what, what film do we make here? That's, uh, and that's where Mark's brilliance comes in. And you know, you keep, you're not gonna abandon the shoot. You keep filming, you keep working, you get as many amazing things as you can. And, and we were very uh, lucky that, that Can Opener appeared for 10 days in a row and showed a, a big interest and then you know, it was up to Mark to take all of that footage from you know, 45 days of, of filming on that shoot and then, and then make what was hopefully a compelling film from it. So that was one shoot? Yeah, well, I had been going to Dominica for 11 years or so. So there was some of my archive over those 11 years. So when, when at the beginning of the film, when it's uh, when I first meet Dolores, I was there with a friend of mine, Mark Sharman, and he filmed the first brilliant interaction. The second year uh, where we encountered Dolores, I was just there with some friends. And so you can see that footage is, is mostly GoPro and sort of non-professional. Uh, and then we went back for the official shoot, which was year three, and we stayed 45 days uh, during the pandemic uh, to film. So Good place to be, outside and underwater, not uh, spreading germs. So, Mark, are you spending those 45 days not sleeping, wondering if any footage is going to come back? What, what was it like seeing that footage for the first time? It was absolutely amazing looking through all the footage and just getting into Patrick's head, which was a, obviously a, a wonderful thing and a huge honor and everything, but trying to understand the emotion that flows between Patrick and, and the, the, the whales, but, but particularly Can Opener and Hope, and trying to tease that out. And Patrick is incredibly modest and actually very scientifically savvy and experienced and everything else. So when you've done that sort of thing a lot, it's very hard to talk about your your emotions and one of the things that Patrick and I tried to do is that I would ring up and say look I'm trying to imagine what it would feel like that being in that moment and he would just to me and then I said can you record that so he'd go under a blanket in his house and imagine that he was underwater again and what he felt and and describe that and Patrick did that absolutely brilliantly he was able to transport himself back into those scenes and then me and then I hope you and that that emotional connection was just awesome to to watch him achieve and to be part of and and that happened during the editing when you'd see you had a hole to fill 
Well, we messed around with it for about nine months or something, didn't we? That it was. Yeah. It was yeah. a long time of figuring it out. <laughs> it was, and it's amazing because a lot of stuff happened in those forty-five days that didn't make the film. Uh, you know, it was Mark really trolling through those hours and hours of footage and saying. You know, some were obvious, but some were less obvious. And, you know, as Mark's looking at the footage and he said, well, it looks like when Can Open or Dove that Hope stayed for a, a whole dive cycle. Am I looking at this right? Because he's looking at my camera and then the cameraman's footage. So there's two cameras rolling. And I said, yeah, that, that's what happened. And he's like, oh, we got to use that. That's brilliant. But there were, you know, it seems obvious when you watch the film, but there was lots of that stuff that Mark just had to interpret and, and then say, oh, well, here's the here's the amazing things that happened in those 45 days that we're, we're going to use. And then it changed, right? We, we, so he starts making the film and then, well, actually, you know what, let's use this other in, encounter that happened instead. And, so. and, and you made a conscious decision not to use scuba? Yeah, the and why? Yeah, the sperm whales don't like it. I've uh, I, I took a very small scuba tank maybe seven or eight years ago, and I, I just had it on a necklace around my neck, and I was doing some free dives, and I would just use that little tank to get it just a little more bottom time, and they were sleeping once, which is when they're all vertical like that, and I went down, and I and I, I wanted to stay longer, so I put that bottle in my mouth, and it wasn't even the exhale where it like it was the inhale, just a simple. <laughs> They opened their eyes, got up, swam away. Gone. Yeah, so they just don't like it. But but that's not sperm whales worldwide. They all are so unique because the sperm whales in Mauritius don't mind. They'll tolerate you on scuba. Sperm whales in Dominica, no way. So. Wow. Um, so how long did it take you to cut this film, Patrick? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'd be really embarrassed to tell you that. <laughs> Um, it took a while. It took about <laughs> nine months <laughs> figuring it out. But what's hard it's is... It's just between you and me, okay? okay. <laughs> what's less really than a year? Uh, oh, yes, it was less than a year. Okay. It was quite a lot less than a year. But, I mean, imagine that you film a whole lot of things, but you don't speak the same language in the case of Wales, and you don't really know what's going on. And the encounters are quite brief but frequent. And you try and piece together what's happening there and what they're feeling and what's in the whale's mind particularly. And that just took a lot of deep delving into the science and trying to then, once we sort of began to understand how animal emotions work and how our emotions react with animals, to try and turn that into a story on the basis of that science and not make it feel like a science documentary, make it feel like a love story, but for it actually to, to be really good, solid science. Did you it feel that you, came, that you came from um, being a diver and a, um, an inquisitor to become a scientist, or did you come from the science background to the diving and... Yeah, I was just fascinated by whales from that visit to the Smithsonian at, at, at 16. Uh, and so when, whenever I had the money, I was traveling around trying to find blue whales. And then you, it, the amazing thing to me was when you realize how little we actually know about these animals. And that's part of the, the draw. So, you know, for example, I, I'm, I'm not a marine biologist. I don't have a science background. I'm just a dude. I'm just some, some guy who loves it and goes out to do it. <laughs> And you know, yeah, just like us, dudes. <laughs> uh, you know, but a few, like a few years ago, for example, I filmed the the world's first footage of of blue whales nursing. And this is the biggest animal to ever inhabit the planet, and and people study them. Never seen them nurse. Didn't know if they did it at depth, at the surface, what time of year, anything. And you know, that kind of stuff is. There's been others like that. But that's pretty amazing that just some dude can go out and with a bit of perseverance can literally see and document and film world first never before seen behaviors that's not the case with lions or or things we can have in captivity so the ocean is just such a vast unknown that that you know it was that realization that god you we don't know anything like just a guy like me can go out and do world changing stuff then i wanted to become much more scientific about it. And that's when I started bringing the camera along a lot more because there were so many amazing things that would happen. And I was in it for the experience, not to make money as a cameraman or document it. I was in it because I think it's incredible and it warms my heart to have these encounters. And then I thought, well, having these amazing encounters, 
like seeing a blue whale nurse does a lot for me, but but what does it do for the blue whales if I don't tell that story, if I don't document it? And so then I started to bring the camera along to sort of share these experiences with the world, which I think ultimately helps the whales. Well, bro, what did, <laughs> where was it? Was it at surface or was it down below? Yeah, it was at the surface. So that was filmed at the surface off the coast of South Sri Lanka about 2016 or so. Yeah. Amazing. Let's uh, have some questions. Do we have... Yes, in the back there. Let me repeat the question for, for Mark. Do you have any concerns that Chris said that if she was 50 years younger, she'd be going out learning how to hold her breath more? Um, do you have any concerns that a film like this, which is so phenomenal and, and um, is going to make more of a negative impact on people trying to go out and see whales? Well, yes, of course, that's a concern. So we discussed a lot how to handle those kind of, of issues. And thankfully, so this film really highlights Dominica. And thankfully, Dominica has a pretty good in-water encounter with whale uh, system where it's very hard to get a permit. To get a permit, they only issue one at a time for the most part. So if I have the permit to get in the water with whales in Dominica, nobody else in the whole country can have that permit uh, over, uh, on overlapping dates. So they are pretty good. And, and the U.S. Is, is probably the best in the world. The U.S., if you want to go film for Blue Planet 2 or whatever, uh, that permit's really expensive. And they check your credentials. They, they, they wouldn't, if you can say, I'm a filmmaker, they, they look into it. Like, uh, a filmmaker, like, for your YouTube channel? Or are you, like, a Netflix BBC filmmaker? So they are pretty good protections. Uh, there's not very many places in the world you can go where they wouldn't... Uh, check you very carefully about what you're doing. So hopefully, but it's absolutely a concern for sure. So so did you make a decision not to put a camera on a whale? Did that change you in, in that way? I mean, you were pretty emotional at that. Yeah, I've, I've you know, had a lot of, of processing to do after that. And I have been asked by other production companies in, uh, since we filmed Patrick and the Whale to put cameras on sperm whales for them, um, for you know whatever nature documentary. And I've made a decision not to do that until uh, I feel like the technology has moved on considerably. Uh, because you can see in that footage, it's, it's a bit grainy, it's dark, we don't see a whole lot. And, and those are the latest tech cameras. And I feel like any of my interactions with whales I have to do a cost benefit analysis on it and think what is this going to do for the whales and is it is it a a net negative or a net positive and in you know they don't love having the camera stuck on them and so unless we're going to really learn a lot from that and be able to protect the species and understand the species better then I'm not going to do it so so until the technology is good enough that we're going to really get new information from it then I'm I'm not willing to do it again you don't have a 10k HMI well, well you know mini, look, mini uh, <laughs> it's incredible cuz I worked on a BBC show called Blue Planet 2 about six years ago, 2017, and the cameras we used in Blue Planet 2 had no lights um, because we just didn't have the technology to get lights light enough and small enough to go into those little onboard cameras. Uh, and, and you know, a couple of years later, 2020, we do. We can put lights in them. So, you know, maybe 2025, we've got, you know, a 10K high-res, low-light camera that we're going to really do some amazing and stuff And you're with. not using giant housings the way we used to see cameras put in and now you're using what just looks like an off-the-shelf yeah. DSLR and yeah that was that was in part for some of the two shots where I'm in the film uh, right. most of the, that was shot with a giant red Gemini camera that is uh -huh. really big <laughs> uh, there was a question over there were you all upside down and <laughs> the surface was below and uh, uh, no, I was playing with the whale by rolling upside down, and she was playing, and then Mark made the brilliant decision. He was looking at it in the edit one day and flipped it upside down and thought, well, geez, that looks, that looks really interesting from the other perspective. And so that was Mark's, uh, Mark's idea. So that you directed that from how many thousand miles away, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, um, the uh, camera woman as well, uh, Gail Jenkinson also, she turned with Patrick and with the the whale, so from from her perspective, it was just keeping everything straight. But looking at the footage, it did turn and it did go upside down. So once I had that shot with the turning, and I knew that was what was in 
Patrick and her and the whale's mind was this idea of this other world and coming into this other world. And the rest was, a you know, it, it fell into place. It just seemed right. Um, and we were lucky with the song as well, which I think helps. It just sort of signposts that this isn't, it goes out of the normal documentary world somehow into something else. Um, and I hope that worked. It was beautiful. We thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming. I'm glad you enjoyed the film. We need a group portrait. Will you do a yeah, selfie with great. me and yeah, everybody yeah. else? Come on, wave, everybody.